Good evening. I'm Michael Rich, and I am the president and CEO of the RAND Corporation. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome each of you here. So RAND is dedicated to making sure, ensuring if we can, that every important decision, and in my mind, what I mean by that is decisions that affect the most people, uh, decisions that involve the most public resources, that those decisions are made with the best available data, the best available lessons from history, uh, the best analysis, uh, essentially the best evidence. And philanthropic support has been absolutely essential to achieving that objective. Uh, philanthropy has enabled us to do some of RAND's most important, uh, most impactful studies over the years. And uh, that's why I wanted to start by thanking the um, members of the RAND Policy Circle who are here. Uh, if you're a member of the Policy Circle, it means you share our commitment to solving America's problems and uh, preparing for America's challenges uh, by using evidence about those problems and challenges. And uh, we appreciate your support. If you are a guest tonight, you're not yet a member of the Policy Circle, I hope you'll consider joining. And the way to do that is to talk to any of my colleagues that have a purple badge, and they'll tell you how to do that. I'm also delighted that we have numerous members, I see, of RAND's, we have 10 advisory boards, and uh, we have numerous members, I see, of those advisory boards. Actually, too many for me to name them today, um, which is actually a good, good uh, problem to have. But I, I do want to make at least one introduction, uh, because I know he's friends of the speaker and he's important to us, and I want to introduce the vice chair of the advisory board for our Center for Middle East Public Policy, uh, former Congressman Howard Berman. So Howard, thank you. Uh, I have known uh, Howard for many, many years, and um, he is uh, always one of the great consumers of RAND research while he was a congressman, a true expert on foreign policy. And we're delighted to have him um, as a member of our advisory board, uh, which is chaired by Steve Hadley. So welcome, Howard. And we have several members of the Consular Corps here tonight. Again, I think too many to, to name, but I do want to acknowledge Abdullah al Sabusi, who is the Consul General of the UAE based here in Los Angeles. So welcome to all of our uh, Consular Corps representatives. Now, RAND has many of these policy circle events uh, every year. You have made a great choice uh, coming to this one with the ambassador from the UAE. And I want to say a few words about the UAE. I'd like to say a few words about the UAE and RAND. And then I want to say a few words about uh, our distinguished guest. So if you saw a list of problems uh, in the Middle East, and it would be a pretty long list, I think, uh, the UAE would not be mentioned on that list. And the reason I say that, I'll give you several uh, reasons. One is, in anticipation of what, we've, uh, of what we now know was an actual oil shock, but I think at the time was a, a projected future oil price shock, and based on the lessons of the past, the UAE took steps now starting over a decade ago to diversify its economy so that um, gas and oil now represent about 30% of UAE's GDP. So whereas the ongoing uh, price uh, drop is a significant challenge for the oil producers in the region, much less so for the UAE. The UAE has a population that is roughly, well, it's less than a third that of Saudi Arabia. It's about a tenth that of, um, of Egypt. And yet, um, it's the largest export market for the United States in the Arab world. It's a booming hub for tourism. I think people know that. It's a great um, a site for transit of, of both passenger and freight, and of course, financial transactions. The UAE Armed Forces numbers about 16,000, but it's already, even at that size, one of the most proficient militaries in the region. It's an expeditionary force. It's been part of the coalition in both Afghanistan and, and uh, Libya. And I could go on, but suffice it to say, if you saw a different kind of a list, a list of bright spots and opportunities in the Middle East, the UAE would be either at or right near the top of that list. Now, one thing that impressed, I've been to the UAE many times, and one thing that, that impressed me in my very early visits was a keen interest in the use of, a keen interest on the part of senior officials in the use of analysis to tackle 
uh, both the planning and the provision of social services. And RAND was commissioned to help develop uh, and evaluate plans and programs in a number of different areas, elementary and secondary education, higher education, environmental protection, law enforcement, and others. Um, in each domain, we encountered uh, talented policymakers, uh, sophisticated collaborators. Now, to be candid, and uh, I think the ambassador knows that uh, candor is uh, one of the core competencies at RAND, uh, we have, our relationship has had uh, its difficulties at times, but through it all, the ambassador and I have agreed on and we focused on the important things we could accomplish together. And I believe that uh, we are on a positive upward path in that regard, and I think his um, uh, decision to visit us uh, tonight is another indication of that. You know, RAND has produced the largest body of published research on public policy problems and solutions, mainly, almost exclusively in English. And what that means is that body of research is not accessible to many, many policymakers in the Arab world uh, and uh, really off limits to most of the general public in the Arabic speaking world. And the UAE now has helped us take a huge stride towards changing that uh, by underwriting the creation of an Arabic language RAND website, which is now launched and up and running and by enabling the translation of more than 200 of our most important documents. And this has been a personal priority of mine and my partner in that initiative is uh, Ambassador Alotaiba. So the program uh, contains some uh, biographical information I've seen about him. I'm not going to repeat that. So let me only say uh, for those of us who, for those of you who have not been to Washington during his uh, tenure, he is one of Washington's most effective most admired diplomats. He's a leading voice for moderation in regional politics. Um, uh, he has helped the United States and his country forge a close and a constructive working relationship on a wide range of uh, bilateral issues as well as regional issues. And I think you'll see in his bio he's been active as well, connecting communities and building bridges in many other ways as, his, as the bio shows. So with that as a backdrop, please join me in welcoming Rand, His Excellency Ambassador Yusuf El Otaiba. Thank you very much, Michael. So, uh, two problems with that introduction. One is you already took all my talking points about the UAE <laughs> and how great the UAE is. And two, you set the bar very high to the audience about me, so now I'm going to disappoint them. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at RAND, and um, Michael invited me here a long time ago. Now that I'm finally here, I'm not sure why I waited so long, but now you're not going to be able to get rid of me. <laughs> Today, I wanted to talk to you about two versions of the Middle East. The one version of conflict and grief is the one you see a lot on TV. But then there's a Middle East of hope and promise, and this one Americans rarely hear about. This is where I'm going to start. Last week, I was home to deliver the commencement address at NYU Abu Dhabi. NYU Abu Dhabi is a bold education initiative. It's an American-style liberal, liberal arts school in the heart of the Middle East. And it's the product of a shared vision between Sheikh Hamad bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, and John Sexton, the former president of NYU. To say it's been a success is an understatement. NYU Abu Dhabi is fast becoming the world's honor college. This year's graduates included 130 students from over 58 countries. And in just three graduating classes, it's already produced six Rhodes Scholars. One of them is an Emirati alumna, and she's now Minister of Youth, for, uh, Minister of Youth Affairs in the UAE. These are literally the world's best and brightest. They could have attended any school in their own country, but instead they challenged tradition and they chose to live and learn among the most diverse student body in the world. When I was speaking at their graduation, I, I honestly felt that there is little I could do or needed to do to inspire this group of students. So instead, I talked to them about how they inspired me. Their confidence, their curiosity, their tolerance are truly an inspiration and a lesson for all of us. This next generation is spreading a culture of hope, a true sense of optimism, opportunity, and openness 
to a region that desperately, desperately needs it. So that's the good news. Now let me turn to two of the biggest dangers that both of our countries face. First is the threat of extreme or radical Islam. And in that, I include ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Muslim Brotherhood, and every other extremist group operating in the, in the region. But the second threat is the persistent and growing threat of Iran. In many ways, the conflict that we are dealing with in Yemen today illustrates exactly how the UAE is meeting these dual challenges. It's a useful lens to see how the UAE is taking the fight directly to the extremists and how we are confronting Iran. Understanding Yemen also helps explain the importance of the close security partnership between the UAE and the United States. First, let me give you a little background. In late 2014, Iranian-backed Houthi rebels forced out the legitimate government of Yemen. The Houthis were armed, trained, and supported by Iran and their Hezbollah proxies. Tehran was not only gaining another foothold in the region, but the political vacuum it created gave, gave rise to a lawless breeding ground for AQAP. Yemen was quickly spiraling downward into a Syria-like scenario. And in 2015, at the invitation of the legitimate government of Yemen, and backed by UN mandate, a coalition led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE took decisive action. That March, we launched airstrikes against the Houthi insurgents. In July, the coalition forces linked up with local resistance fighters to retake Aden, Yemen's second largest city, and it allowed for the return of the legitimate government of Yemen. Since arriving in Aden, the coalition has restored electricity and water, rebuilt more than a dozen clinics and hospitals, renovated 150 schools, established regular food distribution, and put tens of thousands of Yemenis back to work repairing infrastructure. A local police and security force was recruited, trained, and equipped. One interesting anecdote. A UAE woman military doctor, Colonel Aisha Edlari, was among the first group of our special forces to go ashore clandestinely in Yemen. Her assignment was to discreetly assess the needs of local hospitals and clinics, and her reports allowed us to quickly restore basic health services to the city after it was liberated weeks later. After taking back Aden, we then turned our attention to AQAP, Al-Qaeda's most lethal franchise. They are the terrorists responsible for the underwear bomb bomber who almost brought down an American airliner. Its founders carried out the attack on the USS Cole in Aden many years ago, and it was AQAP who trained and dispatched the Charlie Hebdo attackers. Over the last year, the coalition and local Yemeni resistance fighters have systematically eliminated AQAP cells across Aden. And about six weeks ago, the coalition drove AQAP out of McCullough, where it was making $2 million a day through taxes, smuggling, and extortion. The operation killed more than 450 AQAP members and put a much larger number on the run. Mike Morell, who was the former deputy director of the CIA, described the operation as, quote, textbook solution for dealing with terrorists who hold territory. The loss of Mukalla is a major blow to AQAP. It is the equivalent of the Islamic State losing Mosul or Raqqa." End quote. Routing the Houthis in Aden and AQAP in Mukalla have been important steps in helping restore the legitimate government in Yemen. Peace talks are currently underway to bring a lasting political solution to the Yemeni people. But to be clear, the Houthi power grab in Yemen was only possible because of direct and sustained support from Tehran and its proxy Hezbollah. Iran relied on its Syria playbook and sent Hezbollah and IRGC trainers to assist the Houthis. And in just the last five months, the UAE, Saudi, French, Australian, and US navies have intercepted multiple ships coming from Iran carrying weapons to the Houthis. Of course, Yemen is only one part of the broader trend of Iranian aggression across the region. The UAE supported the nuclear deal, hoping that Iran would take the opportunity to turn over a new leaf. But unfortunately, we remain disappointed. Behind all the talk of change, the Iran we have long known, hostile, expansionist, violent, is alive and well and as dangerous as ever. And not just in Yemen, but throughout the region. I'll give you a couple of examples. Until today, the US continues to identify Iran as the leading state sponsor of terror. Two, 
In Gaza, Iraq, Bahrain, Lebanon, and many others, Iran continues to fund and arm radical and subversive groups. Last December, Iran fired unguided rockets dangerously close to a U.S. aircraft carrier. And in October, in November, and again in March, Iran conducted ballistic missile tests in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. This, ag this aggression was not lost on the global community and certainly not among Muslims or the Muslim community. An isolated Iran was recently denounced in a 55 to 1 vote in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation for their interference in the internal affairs of other states. Iran has clearly rejected the promise of change. Instead, the Ayatollah and the IRGC have actually doubled down on their hostility throughout the region. In the UAE, we simply cannot accept this as an unfortunate reality. Rather, the international community in the U.S. must intensify its actions to check Iran's regional, regional ambitions. And all of this gives rise to a very important question for America's allies in the region. What are we going to expect from U.S. policy in the future? How will the next administration manage Iran and the extremist threats that we are facing together? These are the questions that my bosses are asking, and that's why I came here today. We do know one thing, that U.S. disengagement from the region is not the answer. In fact, I can make a very strong case that U.S. disengagement will only lead to more turbulence in the region. An ongoing U.S. commitment to the Middle East is necessary to secure the kind of future that will benefit us all. Rest assured that the UAE and other U.S. allies not only benefit from that security commitment, we contribute to it as well. We fought the Taliban for 12 years alongside American and NATO partners. In a combined mission with the U.S. Air Force, an Emirati woman fighter pilot led the UAE's first strike against ISIS targets in Syria. And we are working with the U.S. as we speak in Africa, taking on Al-Shabaab in Somalia. On the ground in Yemen, UAE servicemen and women are destroying Al-Qaeda. So all across the region, we are on the front line protecting our and your shared interests and values. And just as importantly, we are also on the front line promoting a new vision for young Muslims and the region, an alternative ideology unafraid of modernity and looking to the future. It's a path guided by a phrase repeated by Muslims all around the world. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Let me repeat that one more time. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Respect, inclusion, peace. These are the true tenets of Islam. Ours is an Islam that empowers women, that embraces others, that encourages innovation, and welcomes global engagement. And we are extremely proud that the UAE cabinet now boasts eight women, which is almost one-third of our cabinet. Just last week, representatives from the Muslim Council of Elders visited the Bataclan Theater and other sites of the recent Paris terrorist attacks. The council includes Islam's most prominent and forward-thinking scholars. It's an attempt to give a greater voice to moderate Islam and to modernize the way Islam is taught in schools. It's developing new training programs for imams and updating religious commentaries. This is the Islam we believe in. Our vision for tomorrow is about tolerance. It's about openness. But it's also about innovation and opportunity. In the UAE, we're building an economic engine for the entire region, a place where the free flow of goods and services, people and investment, and ideas lifts the entire Middle East and links it to Africa, to Asia, to Europe, and to the America. This also involves planning for a future that is less dependent on oil, a major step toward a sustainable post-hydrocarbon economy with the goal of increasing our use of clean energy sources to 24% by the year 2021. Earlier this year, we opened a Cleveland clinic in Abu Dhabi, a 350-bed specialty hospital. We are building branches of the Guggenheim and the Louvre. And the Warner Brothers just announced a theme park in Abu Dhabi. In Dubai, an American tech incubator named 17, called 1776 will open an office later this year. In 2020, Dubai will host the World Expo, which will welcome between 20 and 25 million visitors to Dubai in just six months. And in 2021, 
we plan to send a space probe to Mars. This is the Arab world's version of President Kennedy's moonshot. These initiatives create opportunities that people in the region could only once dream of. They also help to drain the energy from extremist groups and encourage kids to pick up books instead of guns. We already have a model in the students of NYU Abu Dhabi. They give me hope that we can realize a new vision for the region and the world based on openness, opportunity, and optimism. When I look ahead in the region, I see more Rhodes Scholars and fewer terrorist recruits, more Mars missions and fewer ballistic missiles, more women leaders and fewer jihadi Janes, more online startups and fewer extremist websites, an Islam of peace, inclusion, not extremes. In the UAE, this is our way forward. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, we're now going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, we just have a couple of things to request. Uh, one, uh, we ask if you uh, do have a question that you raise your hand. And either myself or my colleague Brianna will come around and bring you the mic. Uh, two, we uh, request that you uh, ask just one question at a time so we can get to everyone. Um, we would also ask that you identify yourself um, before you ask your question. Uh, and with that, um, we're looking for questions in the audience. And I'm going to go, I'm going to take the privilege here of uh, going to uh, a RAND colleague here to start it off. OK, thank you. I'm Dahlia Dasake. I direct our Center for Middle East Public Policy. Thank you, Ambassador Taiba, for an absolutely inspirational, visionary uh, speech. Uh, you did, though, present quite a number of challenges in the region. Um, <coughs> you have a, a long list, uh, Yemen, Libya, uh, terrorist groups that you listed, et cetera. How do you prioritize, in your um, assessment or the conversations and debates going on in Abu Dhabi now, uh, what is your priority, um, where are you investing your resources, and how are you um, looking at this variety of threats, since it's so difficult to deal with all of them at once, as, as confident as you are? I wish we had the luxury of being able to sequence our threats, <laughs> but we don't anymore. I mean, maybe we did 10 years ago. But today, if you're living in Abu Dhabi or you're living in Riyadh or Jordan, you're surrounded by a combination of threats. Some of them are from Iran. Some of them are from radical groups. Some of them are from lack of governance. Some of them are from poverty and lack of education. So I don't, I don't think there's the ability to sit and say, we'll do this first, we'll do this second. We are, most of my peers in Abu Dhabi have at least three or four jobs each. <laughs> and you know, we are going 100 miles per hour pretty much all the time. And, and, and anyone who's been to Abu Dhabi knows that when you meet with someone, you're meeting someone in one, or one of three or four capacities. I think it's important for us to demonstrate, though, that it's not just crises. I mean, what I try to get across here is we've shown that we can produce a moderate, version of a Middle East society. We've proven that you can be a Muslim and moderate at the same time. We've proven that we can do a safe nuclear program. We've proven that we're focused on climate change. We've showed that the role of women is important. These are equally as important as fighting in Yemen. These are equally as important as, as fighting ISIS. If we do not present an alternative model for our young people, we're going to be stuck fighting all the time. And I think this is what I really want to get across, that in the Middle East, it is possible to, to do everything I've mentioned. We just need leadership. We need strategy. We need partners. We need determination. But it can be done. We have a question for you. My name is Dee Shaw. I'm a policy circle member. How do you see the crisis now in Syria playing out? <laughs> You've asked about the one subject that I'm the most pessimistic on. Um, unfortunately, I, I think part of the problem in Syria, uh, up until now, essentially that have been in our coalition or in our you know, group of friends, we have had conflicting objectives. 
We haven't been all going after the same objective at the same time. And I'll give you an analogy because I used to play sports. It's like having a team that, has, that is shooting at two different targets at the same time. And so I think we haven't been able to, to be effective on Syria because we have not been aligned as a team. But at the same time, I think we've actually moved to a, to a phase where the role of our, our countries, UAE, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and so on, ever since Russia stepped into Syria, our role has been diminished. I think there's very little impact or influence that we as a region can have on the outcome in Syria, because I think now the outcome in Syria is largely going to be determined between the United States and Russia. So I, I think we will be as helpful as we can, but in reality, this has now been, this has been moved above our pay grade. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, we have a question here. Thank you so much for one of the most inspiring and optimistic uh, presentations we've had with respect to the Middle East for a long, long time. And we're delighted to have you here at RAND. Thank you. Um, I have a, a curious question, I think, in that Obama has uh, commented uh, frequently about how uh, Yemen was one of his wonderful successes. And uh, I heard, I think, unless I misunderstood, that you were suggesting that perhaps the U.S. should not be a big, important part of um, deciding what happens or imposing their um, decisions upon the, the Middle East. Can you tell us what America could do to be helpful in your objectives? I think, first and foremost, we need to have an open dialogue and an open communication. doesn't mean we're always going to agree. You know, no two countries agree on everything, so I, I'm okay with that. But I think just having an honest and open and forthcoming dialogue is very helpful. I'm, I didn't, if, if, I, if my comments indicated that I, we want the U.S. not to be involved or not to play a role, that's not what I meant, so I apologize. But I do think we are entering a world where countries in the region are willing to step up and play a role, a, a much bigger role than they were before. And I often have this debate in Washington, which is, well, the U.S. did this and it didn't work, they did that and it didn't work. We're not asking the U.S. to deploy hundreds of thousands of troops. We're not asking the U.S. to deploy billions of dollars. I think those days are behind us. The days where the Desert Storm, where 500,000 soldiers were deployed, that's not going to happen again. We understand that. I think the key theme going forward for, for any admit, administration in the U.S. is going to be more about burden sharing. What can we do together to fix Yemen? What can we do together to fix Libya? What can we do together to contain Iran? But I'm a firm believer that we have to start with defining the objective and then work our way backwards. We have been largely in a crisis management mode for the last four years, and it has prevented us from reaching solutions because we haven't been able to define the objective. So my advice to you know, the next administration is let's start by defining what the objective is. What kind of Middle East do we want 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And once you define that, it'll be very easy to work backwards and make a plan for Yemen, make a plan for Libya, make a plan for Iraq. But I think we need to start by being aligned in terms of what our objectives are. We have a question here. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for coming today. Um, my name is Eric Pleiser. Uh, you're speaking of 10, 20 years in the future and the changing situation all around the Middle East and the Gulf. Uh, I'm curious, uh, I, I read that uh, Israel actually has its first mission uh, in Abu Dhabi. I think it's the UN climate change. Um, yeah. That's obviously a significant change. Given what's going on, shifting governments, shifting problems, how do you see that relationship between uh, Israel and UAE and, and uh, the neighbors in the region evolving over time? I think uh, we all live in the same area, so we can't pretend we're not there. Right, Israel is part of our region. Um, the agreement for them to sit in or participate in arena, that was a decision before we even began competing for arena. We have no problem with Israel being part of a multilateral, UN mandated uh, multilateral organization. Absolutely no problem. The question I often get is, what about your re UAE's relationship with Israel? When are you going to normalize relations? And my answer is very simple. As soon as there's a Palestinian deal, that's when the entire Arab League will be able to normalize their relationship with Israel the day after. And so I, I was talking to a friend of mine last night, 
And he said, you know, I'm, I'm for the two-state solution, but I'm not for the two-state solution because of the Palestinians. I'm for it because of the Israelis. So I think it's important also for Israel to understand that the two-state solution and the Arab Peace Initiative, which will normalize their relationship with 22 Arab countries, is a benefit for them. It's not a benefit just for us. And we have to get into the mindset of a, this is a win-win, not a zero-sum game. And the sooner we can get there, the sooner we can resolve a lot of our problems. We have a question here. Again, Ambassador, thank you for being here. Your words have been so instructive and so helpful in understanding a really difficult position. My name is Ann Baish. My question is, um, several days ago, the uh, UAE Minister for Oil at the OPEC meetings in Vienna stated that he was thrilled that the oil prices were going up. Of course, the United States has become a competitor in this market. What would be some of your thoughts on that? I think oil, uh, first of all, I'm not an expert. Um, so I'm going to give you my, my very superficial two cents on oil. I don't think we compete with the US in terms of producing oil. Oil is produced all around the world and has a global market. And it's, this market is balanced by supply and demand. Right now, the prices are going up because, because some producers were priced out of their production uh, uh, costs. So as production goes down, prices will go up. I think it's important for us to coordinate. I mean, there were days 20 years ago when OPEC had a meeting, and OPEC would determine what would happen. They would determine the price. They would determine the, the demand. And they kind of controlled the market. That doesn't exist anymore. There is more production outside of OPEC today than inside of OPEC. And OPEC is divided. And so I think our ability to influence prices is very limited. If, it, if we had more ability to influence the prices, we, we would have raised the price a long time ago. Uh, my budget goes down when oil prices go down. Um, but I think it's important to highlight also what the UAE economy looks like based on oil and gas. So today, UAE economy is 70% non-oil and gas sector. GDP of UAE is only 30% oil and gas. And that's very impressive for a country that produces 2.8 million barrels a day. But that's because we started on this diversification program about 15, 20 years ago. We went through a price shock, and we discovered that if we're completely reliant on one sector, and this sector falls, we're in trouble. And so that began our diversification program. So today, Price, if the price goes down, yes, it affects our revenue, but our economy is still growing at 3% per year. So I, I think ultimately where we want to reach is a point where the price of oil and gas doesn't affect our daily livelihood. And I don't think it'll have any impact on the US at all. We've got a question back here, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Your, your message and your vision are the hope of our world. Um, I work with uh, Neighborhood Legal Services. We're trying to, we were having discussions about building global neighborhoods and the role that social media can play in helping achieve that. We all know that radical Islam exploits social media to try and radicalize others. How do we you know, proactively engage that and show them the vision what, of what you've opened our eyes to here today to other good Muslims of goodwill that there's another path at least towards the abundance of life and not a life of death? We have to out-communicate them. Right now, they're out-communicating us. They're out tweeting us. They're out Facebooking us. You know, the, the technologies that were invented here are being manipulated over there against us. And so we have to use the same exact tools, but we have to be better. We have to be more effective. And we're on the right side of this. I, I, I don't accept losing this battle if we are on the right side of this. So we don't have a choice. We actually have to do much better, whether it's on social media, whether it's on educating people about our religion, whether it's on how we raise our kids and showing them the right values. I think it's very important to focus on how Islam is taught, it's explained, and it's perceived. I think there is a problem with how Islam is perceived around the world today, and around the world, not just in the US. And it's our problem to fix. We have to do that. Uh, but we're going to have to do a lot better than we're doing now. But that's a problem that we have to take responsibility for. I mean, I, I was raised in a house in, in Egypt where the version of Islam I was taught has nothing to do with how it's perceived today. 
but I, it's not my place to go out there and preach that to the whole world. Because to me, religion is a personal issue. You know, how I practice my religion is between me and my God. It's not something I'm supposed to advertise. So that's part of the challenge why we don't go out and respond. Um, but I think we, we have reached a point where Islam is seen as a liability. Our, a religion of 1.5 billion people is seen as a problem. And we have to fix that. A question over here. Uh, I'm Albert Carney. So one of the responsibilities of an ambassador, of course, is to report back to your government what you think is going on in the country <laughs> you're in. We hear a great deal about the reactions of the rest of the world to what is going on in our country politically. I don't expect you to endorse a candidate, but I would like to know what is your reaction as an ambassador to what's going on in the United States today? How do I get out of answering this? <laughs> first, first, can anyone here give me a prediction on California's primary next Tuesday? What's going to happen? Because I have to report that, too. Um, I'll give you my personal, my personal opinion. Um, confused. Honestly confused. Um, I've seen the US. Actually, we had an event today earlier. And one of the questions was, because um, I went to school in Washington in the early 90s. And they said, how is Washington different today than it was when you were in college? And the first thing I thought of was, it's much more polarized. It's much, much more polarized. I don't remember hearing this tenor of discourse. I never, I don't remember hearing this kind of division in the political space. And I think Congressman Berman here would, would echo my sentiments. Um, so I'm worried about how much more polarized it will get. And, and again, this is your country. So you know, your responsibility, not mine. I'm going to take responsibility for my country. Um, but explain to me how we, we have solutions. How do we have legislation to solve problems? The more polarized we get, the less we're able to compromise. And how to resolve climate change if, we don't, if we're not able to compromise? I mean, within the U.S., much less the international community. So I'm, I will, I'll avoid individual candidates, but I am worried about how much more polarized this country is getting, and therefore its ability to work with others and solve big problems. So we've got another question back here, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Ambassador, uh, Brian Ord, thank you for being here. Um, spent some time over in your part of the world about 25 years ago. The nature of that area of the world is very tribal. Um, I'm curious how the UAE overcame some of those tribal issues, more of a rules-based society, and made that transfer, transformation into a rules-based society, and how the Arab world might deal with that, given some of its challenges. Yeah, it's a very good question. Leadership, pragmatism, solution basis based approach to problems you know we can be tribal all we want but it's not going to deliver a high-end telecom telecom system or a high high-end infrastructure system or a, a highway system we have to develop the country the country's assets the country's nationalism sense of nationalism I think what is unique to me about the UAE today is the sense of pride, the sense of nationalism, the sense of how people look up to their leadership in the UAE. Go walk around with Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed anywhere in the public and how, see how many people line up to take a picture with him. Um, that I think is unique to us. The social compact in our part of the world is the government will look after its people, and the people will ultimately be loyal to them. That's kind of how it works. It's very simple. It's, we don't need to overcomplicate it. And the more effectively you work on that social compact, the more effectively you provide for your people, whether it's health care or education or infrastructure or security or jobs, then your people are going to be loyal to you. And I think that's how you overcome tribalism, by being loyal to your country because your country is looking after you. 
It's, it's, it almost sounds like a cliche, but it's really that simple. And I think we've done that from, from what I see, and I'm not saying this because I'm a diplomat, I see it because we're fighting a war in Yemen. And I see how the country's rallied around the military and the country. And it's, it's very impressive. That's how you overcome tribalism. And Mr. Ambassador, do you have a question here? Ambassador, thank you for being here this evening. Peter Griffith is my name. Um, I'd like to ask you, when you're invited back here in four years, what will Rand write as a matter of uh, data and evidence that has led, what are the key imperatives that they'll write about that's led to greater inclusion? You use that word several times. Yes. That's a really important word here Absolutely. In, in, in the United States. And I'd really like to understand that more, and especially, uh, I would say, uh, since I have three daughters with respect to women. I think if you start with the premise that pluralism is good, that in our, in our situation, the UAE, we're only 44 years old. And in a population of 10 million people, UAE nationals are only 1.3 million. So we're just over 10% of our population. Unless you accept that you're going to have to work with others, that you're going to have to bring others to help you, that others are going to help you run and manage your country. If you don't accept that premise, inclus inclusion is going to be impossible. If you're going to nationalize everything, or if you're going to dismiss everyone who doesn't look like you or sound like you, it's going to be very difficult. Um, I think it's very important to, I have a five-year-old kid and a three-year-old. I have a five-year-old boy and a three-year-old daughter. I want them to, to think that whatever, whoever they talk to, is just like them, that they're no different. And by the way, that's how I was raised. So if we don't teach our kids that, it doesn't matter what the, the national policy is 10 years later or 15 years later. You have to teach them the right values. And, and that's not the, the job of the government, by the way. That's the job of us and our homes. So. And I think as a, as a father, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Mr. Ambassador, we have a question here on your left. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very uh, uh, insightful talk. Um, and just to bring up the elephant in the room, uh, Donald Trump, um, uh, briefly touched on, but not by name. Um, how does the UAE view a Trump presidency? I know some of your business people have said, uh, I think it's Khalaf al Abtour that uh, he would not invest in the U.S. if Trump was president. Uh, so what is the reaction uh, in your country? I think uh, Khalaf al Habtour is uh, uh, very outspoken, and, and he's not shy. <laughs> uh, but I think he honestly reflects the view of a lot of people. Um, whether Mr. Trump believes in some of the statements he's made or not, I don't understand how you're going to ban 1.5 billion Muslims from coming into the U.S. How are you going to defeat extremism together if you ban uh, almost a fifth of the global population? Um, what I think is not being understood, or what I think is being promoted is, again, is this, it's us versus them. We're on the same side. We're on the same side when it comes to fighting extremism. We're on the same side when it comes to teaching our kids, I'm pretty sure if you have children, you want the same thing for your children as I do for mine. Right? We're not that different. So the more we try to divide ourselves, I think we're not going to be able to solve any problems. As for Mr. Trump's policies, I, it's hard to, really hard to predict. I, I imagine whoever wins the White House will learn that it's incredibly difficult to actually execute a lot of the things he's saying. <laughs> Um, I, I think there's a lot of restrictions on whoever becomes president just by the nature of the office. So how it gets carried out, I, I, I'm not really sure, but I haven't spent a lot of time worrying about it right now. Right, we've got another question here. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your talk today, and it's very inspiring, as many people have said. My question is that when you have that degree of capacity to talk about processes and 
modern uh, versions of Islam and modern versions of, of uh, economies and so on. Do you have any plans for a Peace Corps? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Um, we have launched national military service two years ago. It's not what most would, what most people would commonly think is the reason why. We don't want a stronger military or a bigger military. We launched a military service because we felt that the concept of the nation state in the Middle East is eroding. So going back to the tribalism question, people are associating with their tribe. People are associating with their sect. People are associating whether they're from the north or from the south. People are, be, are joining groups that put the ideology of the group before the national interest of the country they're in. Muslim Brotherhood is a perfect example. We are combating that by having 18 to 30 year old men serve either nine months or, 12, or two years in the national military service so they can come out understanding that the country comes first. Not their tribe, not which emirate they're from, not how they practice their religion. So for us, the solution or the antidote to a lot of these problems is having a sense of nationalism, having a sense of pride, of uh, being proud of you know, showing the UAE flag. And so that was the reason behind the military service. It's not the Peace Corps, but I think it's, it's similar in terms of what we're trying to get out of it. Mr. Ambassador, we have a question here. Hello, um, I just wanted to thank you for coming, first of all. Um, my name is Julia Clark, and I'm a student at American University in Washington, D.C. Um, I study international studies, and I just finished my first year studying Arabic. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, so you shared a very amazing anecdote regarding the students at NYU Abu Dhabi and how you didn't see any lack of passion or any lack of curiosity. That was all there. Absolutely. Um, and I agree with you. I see that on my campus every day, um, just like living in the dorms. and Everybody just wants to talk about these things and discuss all of this. Um, but what are some of the challenges that you foresee for students like me um, who do want to get involved in Middle Eastern like policy issues? And do you have any recommendations for uh, like overcoming those challenges? No, I don't see any challenges. Uh, you're welcome to come to Abu Dhabi anytime you're ready. <laughs> please, please, I would uh, love to. <laughs> quite the opposite. I think, I really believe because NYU Abu Dhabi is so diverse, every student there gets along with any other ethnicity or background or anything. The first year we had a graduating class in 2014, President Clinton gave and gave, came and gave the commencement speech. And he was telling me about a story. So there was a competition within the university and the, the two winning teams, one team was an Indian and a Pakistani student. The other team was a Chinese and a Taiwanese student. And so he wanted to give the awards. President Clinton being innately political, um, <laughs> said, are you sure you want to have your picture taken with each other? Like, this won't cause a problem for you back home? And the response from the students was the best part. They said, oh, we're so over that stuff. That stuff doesn't matter. Instilling that in young people is the only way we get out of these problems. It's, it's the older people that we have a problem with. <laughs> Mr. Investor, we have a question here on your left. I'm Rob Ayler. I'm on the advisory board for Asia Pacific with Rand. And my question to you is, how would you describe the evolving cultural differences or relations with Saudi Arabia as they just now start, I guess, diversification you've been yep. doing for 10 years? And the second question is, do you have any ongoing communications with, say, the Muslim organizations in Indonesia where they're quite mo uh, moderate? Yes, yes, I actually met with someone um, from one of their main Muslim organizations a few months back. So yes, the, the, the second answer to your second question is yes. The first answer is, I think Saudi Arabia is finally doing uh, the steps that all of us have kind of concluded a long time ago is necessary economically and socially. I think it's very important for them to kind of, in their own words, wean themselves off of the addiction to oil. You know, this. While this oil drop was very harmful and affected their economy and affected their revenue, it was also a wake up call. It was, their, it was their moment where they said, we can't keep doing this. We have to diversify our economy. And, and, and in fact, many officials in Saudi Arabia are looking at the UAE as the role model of what we did in our diversification strategy. 
to, to use that as a kind of a starting mm -hmm. off point for what they need to do. So I think, given what I'm seeing and hearing, I'm very, very optimistic about the direction Saudi is taking, both on the economic side and on the social side. Oh, we have a question here. Thank you for coming today. Um, in regards to the current administration's long-term goal, whatever that is, uh, as to what they want to see happen in the Middle East between the countries, there's numerous internal policies that people are trying to be heard or, or take within government. It could be CIA, it could be military, it could be congressional. Is there a cohesion that America has, or is the administration fighting with everybody to get what they want? I think the environment we're in facilitates in Washington more divisions within agencies. If everything was going fine, I think it would be a lot easier for any government to be unified in its approach. But if you, I mean, pick an issue, Libya, I think the State Department would have one view, the Pentagon would have a different view, and the agency would have a different view. How those three views get, you know, uh, coalesced into one is very challenging. And it's very challenging, especially because we're in, you know, the final stretch of the administration. So I, I think the challenges the administration is facing is the same challenge any administration at this point in the game would face if the situation was similar in the region. And by the way, there's divisions within our part of the world, too, on how to address these problems. So it's not exclusive to, to the U.S. But I, I think, again, I'd like to stress the approach of doing things backwards. So. I have zero sense of direction when I'm driving. So what I do is wherever I'm going, I, I input the destination in the GPS. The GPS tells me where I need to go, and then we figure out a route. And I think this is what we need to do. We need to program the destination first, and then figure out the route. What we're trying to do now is navigate a route without knowing really where we're ending up. All right, we're getting uh, very close to the end of our program here. We're going to have one question here. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I'm Bill Scott. My wife and I recently were in Dubai, and we were very impressed with the amount of immigrants you've got there that are seemingly be very, very happy. Wondering if you guys are accepting any Syrians into the immigrants into your country. Yes, the answer is yes. We've accepted. In the first two years, uh, about 120,000 Syrian refugees. Now, in the UAE, we have not signed the Convention on Refugees, so they're not considered refugees. To live in the UAE, you have to be employed. So they're actually living and employed. They're not in a refugee camp or in tents. And most of those 120,000 already had family in the UAE, so they're probably living close to their relatives and so on. So they're living there, and they're actually employed and doing fairly well. But I just want to point out a demographic issue. We are one million people in a country of 10 million people. It's very difficult for us to accept large numbers of refugees just because of demographics. So I'd like to ask you for one second to consider if in the US, American citizens were 10% of the population, what would your refugee policy look like? So it's, it's, it's a difficult problem for us, but it's based on facts. It's based on numbers that I, I, I'm pretty sure the UAE is the, the lowest percentage of the world of, UAE, of nationals to expats. So I, I think that would color your policy as well if, if your demographics look like that. So we have time for one last question, which I'm actually going to give the microphone to uh, Mr. Rich here. You know, in, instead of asking a question, I think I'm just going to um, ask everybody uh, to join me in thanking the ambassador. It's true that I... Um, I issued this invitation several years ago. And uh, I would see the ambassador several times a year. I reiterated the invitation uh, 
I've got a new approach this time for my invitation to return. I'm going to make it in front of 150 people <laughs> uh, and, and uh, hope that we'll be able to welcome you again. Duran, you're, you're always welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, as a, a token of our appreciation, I wanted to present a, a small gift uh, so that you'll remember your visit to Rand. Yusuf, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This, this, it, it, when people go to Abu Dhabi, you have to see this mosque to believe it. It's really a, a wonder of the modern world. I appreciate this very much. Thank you. Thank you.